Hello, I'm Yvette Torres. Welcome to another edition of The Road to Recovery. Today we'll be talking about the language that we use on issues related to addiction and recovery. Joining us in our panel today are Daphne Bell, Director of Communications, Treatment Alternatives for Safe Communities, Task Incorporated, Chicago, Illinois. Dr. John Kelly, Associate Professor in Psychiatry, Massachusetts General Hospital, Harvard Medical School, Boston, Massachusetts. Laureen McNeil, Director, Bureau of Recovery Services, New York State Office of Alcoholism and Substance Abuse Services, New York, New York. Carlos Hardy, Director of Public Affairs, Baltimore Substance Abuse Systems Incorporated, Baltimore, Maryland. John, what role does language play in forming public opinion on addiction and mental health issues? I think uh, language plays uh, a critical role in the way that, after all, it's the, it conveys the meaning of, of what we're trying to express. And um, so I think it plays a, a very important role, in, and we should think carefully about the terms that we use because of that. So. Why does some language impede the understanding, Laureen, uh, of, of our field and the way we refer to people? Well, I think particularly now that we have this new recovery framework, people are holding on to the old language. And the new language really holds the fullness of the framework. It really shows the validity of the framework. It shows the reality of recovery. And so the fact that people are holding on to that old language is really impeding us from moving forward into this new framework. And Daphne, what, ty what are we talking about in terms of the old language, the new language, and, and, and the transition that we're trying to create? Old language is using phrases like addict, junkie, user, substance abuser, calling people by, rather than calling people people, then we're using terms that define them by an action, and that is inappropriate. New language refers to a person, a John, a Lorene, a Carlos, Daphne. We are people, first and foremost, and we may be people with histories of substance use disorders or whatever term that we choose to use, how we choose to call ourselves. But the old, way, lang the old language talks about a person in association with the illness. The new language is the person. The illness or a value-laden uh, opinion about that person and not even referring to that person. Thank you, yes. The old language is more judgmental. Uh, it makes uh, moral statements and moral judgments. And the new language talks about this as a health issue. This is a health issue that we're dealing with, and the old language doesn't acknowledge that. And Carlos, did that affect you in your path to recovery? It did early on. Um, um, September is really important for me because it happens to be my anniversary month in recovery. It's also recovery month. So it is also <laughs> recovery month. Thank you for pointing that out. But September 23rd will represent my 17th year as a person in long-term recovery. And so I go back to my first um, opportunity to be in the treatment and some of the labels. And what was really interesting is that folks in the program themselves were labeling themselves. So the, uh, you could be in a 12-step meeting and it's recommended a uh, particular fellowship that I attend that you identify yourself simply as an addict. And folks thought it was real cute uh, to identify themselves as low bottom or a rock star or some of the things. So for as much as society and the public labels us or attaches labels, early in the recovery process, folks had a tendency back in the day to label them own, their own selves as well. And John, therein lies the conundrum, I think. I, I, the, the, the notion of the mutual support process does promote and sustain a certain type of language that would tend to perpetuate, I believe, the very uh, labels that we're trying to overcome. Is that correct? I think so, because these these terms are so embedded in, in our culture and our psyche that it takes a long time for them to, to change. Um, even in spite of, uh, as Daphne was saying, you know, the new 
um, scientific knowledge we have of the nature of these disorders. Talk a little bit about that. Well, in terms of, uh, we, we've learned a lot in the last 25 years in terms of, uh, I think particularly neuroscience findings um, that have really elucidated the mechanisms, the kind of brain damage that occurs as a function of chronic exposure to alcohol and other drugs. And this has really uh, helped us really understand what's really going on and why people who historically have been viewed as, as having weak character um, and weak will uh, is really a function of brain damage which impairs their ability to regulate those impulses. And that's, I think, very, very important. And I think, given that understanding, I think it's very important that we establish and convey the new terms, as people have talked about. For example, calling it a disorder if it's a disorder, a substance use disorder. Uh, and of course, when you use a term such as calling someone ha as having a substance use disorder as, as opposed to a substance abuser, the distinction there, I think, can be, when, when you stop and think about it, um, can be quite clear. One's more of a medical connotation, the other one's more of a judgmental in identifying the individual themselves as the as the disorder, instead of, as Daphne was saying, a person with the disorder. Mm -hmm. um, but it is very difficult, I think. It takes a long time to, to change these terms in the cultural psyche. And so this is why this is such a good idea. Well, hopefully today. today we can enlighten folks right. and, and exactly. encourage them. Carlos, I think you were going to say something. I, I think we've done a great job of, of identifying and quantifying the scientific and the clinical aspects of it. I think, uh, and, and so we have slogans that we back it up with, like treatment works, recovery happens, or treatment is effective. But my, my concern or my issue is how does that message resonate within uh, non-traditional groups, if you will, the community person that has a treatment program as a neighbor, what, uh, what kind of message do we convey to them beyond what they see? Uh, and so I think it's real important that, and, and I think Bill White talks about this, that the greatest stigma reducer is when you begin to promote these relationships, the interactions between communities and people in recovery, or uh, the interaction between treatment programs and the neighborhoods where they're located. And I think it's really, really important. And Laureen, I want to go into the, the treatment system itself. Are there opportunities for the treatment system, the individuals that are providing the treatment, and you're, you're an estate entity, mm -hmm. and certainly this program is sponsored by a federal entity, mm -hmm. are there opportunities for, for those entities to look at the change that needs to happen in language and, and, and what can be done about that? I think it's very important. I do think it's an opportunity. One of the things that we're doing in New York is that we've taken the language that SAMHSA has promoted and we have sort of tweaked it. We have a one pager, um, two sided, that we are going to be taken to every meeting, every meeting with a provider, every convention, everywhere, because we do think that language is important and there is an opportunity. We are working with the treatment system on this whole uh, move towards the recovery framework and language is very, very important. The whole idea that, um, that uh, recovery is self-directed, we need to be able for people to self-talk. One of the things when John was talking about the disease, um, one of the things that I remember very clearly is how the addict feels about themselves and how the language really impacts you. Being called a junkie, being called an addict, you begin to believe that. You begin to, en to enact that behavior. So it's very, very important that while people are in treatment, and not only treatment, the other pathways, um, the, the faith institutions, we want to get this information to them, the, the mental health system, the child welfare system, all different systems. We want to get this language to them so that people will begin to adapt this language and begin to get it to the people that they serve. And, and it's very, very important. Just briefly, give us your own example. I know you're in recovery. Give us your own example of experiences that you may have had where ha you were able to correct someone or, or educate someone. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was a, um, a program manager early in my recovery, and I actually went out to a program, and I was reviewing the program, and I was asking about certain things that I saw in certain records. And the director of the program said to me, after I questioned her for a while, and this was someone who, who was a leader in the field, she said, well, you know, they're just junkies. 
And that really hit me because those people that she's talking about who were just junkies, she didn't realize that I was one of those people, you know, and I have not forgotten where I came from. And so to say that, it really shows me your whole thought, the whole, and how can you help people to recover if you believe, if you have this belief about them. Mm -hmm. And when we come back, we're going to continue to chat about both inside our field and externally, how to deal with the language issue. We'll be right back. Language plays a critical role, like the media, when we are talking about media, when we're talking about images, when we're talking about uh, an individual's sense of uh, shame or guilt or expectation. Language used by those around them, or even language in, that they use themselves, about themselves, can affect their willingness to pursue a recovery, to pursue uh, rehabilitation. We, on one hand, want to offer hope, on the other hand, we want to stress that being uh, in the throes of your addiction is not a, a, a good experience without casting aspersions on the character of the person who has the problem. Where's mom? Did she forget me? I wonder what happened to her. What if I get left here? Drugs and alcohol may make you forget your problems for a moment, but that's not all you forget. My mother worked hard to be in recovery, and I love her for that. For drug and alcohol treatment for you or someone you love, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. I had no idea it was going to be so hard. I didn't know what to expect. You hear the stories, but I never took any of it seriously until I found myself here, and then I realized I was going to have to work hard for my recovery. If you or someone you know has a drug or alcohol problem, you are not alone. Call 1-800-662-HELP. Recovery was the hardest job I ever had, and the most important. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Well, my passion is really uh, advocacy around treatment and recovery issues. Uh, I've had the, the wonderful uh, career over the past 16, 17 years of being a direct service provider, being a treatment and recovery advocate, uh, to heading up a large advocacy organization to actually working inside right now. And my primary purpose is to make sure that the next person, that person that's still out there using now, when they do have this aha moment, that the system is ready to welcome them and to embrace them and support them as they begin their journey on recovery. What recovery has brought to me is an ability to take it to the next level and, and be vocal about it, not be ashamed, you know, not hide behind a wall because you're afraid that, oh, well, God, they're going to know that I'm a recovering addict. Well, I like to say that I'm in long-term recovery as opposed to an addict or an alcoholic because there's more positive sounding because people still run with, well, addict, ooh, bad, alcoholic, ooh, troublemaker. But long-term recovery has a nice twist to it and if I can't give it back, I'll lose it. Carlos, I'm coming back to our own field. I think Laureen mentioned some issues related to how her coworker referred. But should we be looking internally uh, first and, and seeing how we ourselves feel about those that we serve? I, I think it's important. As a matter of fact, I believe it's critical. Um, what's really unique in my uh, human service career of about 16 to 17 years, I started out as a direct service provider and managing supportive housing programs where a lot of our um, uh, residents were coming from treatment programs. And then I worked five years as a, a drug treatment organizer looking at the whole NIMBY issue. And, what and is NIMBY some, is? Not in my backyard. Uh, and there's a whole host of uh, acronyms that you can use. Um, 
And then I actually was executive director for the National Council on Alcoholism and Drug Dependence for a couple of years. And all of that to say is that I focused a lot on the advocacy part of it and, and pushing the system, if you will. Um, and, and what I began to see once I came on the inside with my current organization is there is stigma and discrimination and biases within the field, uh, probably just if not to a larger degree than what you see outside. I, I think the whole issue of medication-assisted treatment uh, mm -hmm. is, is one that, that we just don't want to talk about. I think some of it is is that the workforce is basically trained in a certain modality or methodology or clinical approach and don't want to veer far from that approach. But in this new day, in this new age, we're, we're focusing more on a strength-based approach, approach, a person-centered approach, more so than identifying the person by an action. And John, should we be looking internally first? And, and, and if so, how do we approach uh, the education of our field first? You know, because as we're sitting here, you know, we're talking about how everyone else perceives, you know, their, their moral value-laden uh, approach towards this field. And, and, and how do we deal internally? It's a good question. Um, I, 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 uh, I think we have to treat it the same way as we as we treat out, you know individuals trying to convey the message outside of the field. Uh, it's very ironic to me that in the studies that have been done, um, they've been done a lot with mental health clinicians actually who are uh, professionally focused in the area of addiction and mental health. Um, actually, hold have been shown to hold very um, biased, prejudiced, stigmatizing attitudes towards people, um, uh, and clever studies that have been done have shown this. So what you're talking about seems to be supported by uh, empirical evidence, um, which always is kind of baffling when you, th you know, think about um, uh, people actually educated uh, in the areas that they're actually, and still hold these maybe implicit unconscious biases um, that can be elucidated through these studies. Um, so uh, I think, uh, it, and as I mentioned before, it, it's, it's so embedded in our psyche and culture, it's very hard to shift that. But you have to take very conscious, I think, proactive efforts to do that. Um, you know, we, we were talking earlier about the, the fact that it's embedded even in the, the institutes themselves who are trying to destigmatize the conditions um, that they're focused on. By their names. By their names uh, and also in, in, in published literature. It's not uncommon to see the term abuser, you know, be individuals referred to as, a, as a, a, an alcohol abuser or a drug abuser, substance abuser, uh, when uh, by the same token uh, we're publishing materials which are advocating against using those t kinds of terms. So there's obviously a, a disconnect. Uh, Daphne. There are many people in the field who came into this field in the 70s and in the 80s when we were using the old language. So for each of us personally, this is a process of learning and enlightenment and we each have to recognize our own language and first become conscious of what we're saying and this is about raising consciousness about what are the words that we're using what do they mean how do they further stigmatize or label or keep people in a place that is negative as opposed to language that elevates and we each have to come to this individually and then we do it as a field because language does in t indeed shape our thinking and our thinking shapes our behaviors and our decisions which of course shape our lives and so our language can actually either affect positive change or keep us in a negative place so we as a field and it's fantastic that SAMHSA is hosting this conversation because it's part of just raising awareness and talking with each other about what are we saying and what, what word does work? But we certainly, I think, can look at some of the words and say, this is not effective anymore and we can move beyond that. I think there are some other issues going on here though. I think that there is a resistance to the move from the acute crisis model to the chronic care model for a lot of different reasons. And I think that language becomes one entity of that. So why are you saying that I can't use substance abuser? I've used it all the time. What's wrong with that? And I think that we have to recognize that. And then we do have to do a lot of presentations, a lot of discussions like this. And, and I really appreciate uh, the fact that SAMHSA is supporting this new language. Even within, and I, I have to admit, even within our own agency, I mean, 
uh, our our team in the consumer affairs office checks you know uh, many many materials that are going to be put out and sometimes it's even internally it's very difficult to keep everyone on a straight and narrow path of using mm -hmm. uh, Daphne uh, was involved with us at one point in in creating a document that is still out in draft mm -hmm. uh, uh, related to language and that people are using now. Mm -hmm. uh, do you remember that, Daphne? I do remember, and it was based a lot on the work of William White, who has written so much on language and the rhetoric of recovery mm -hmm. and what words keep us stuck and what words move us for, forward. For example, example, the issue of relapse. We talk about relapse, and in other illnesses, we might talk about a recurrence. Or we might talk about reinitiation, mm -hmm. but relapse somehow focuses on this was the expected negative outcome. And the so failure. again, it goes back to the consciousness and what are we conveying and what, what kind of expectations are we conveying with our language. And there are a number of those uh, examples that can be found actually on William White's website and uh, and other publications that have been done by SAMHSA and by Faces and Voices of Recovery. There are some wonderful resources to help us become more conscious of the language we use. And that connects to um, the fact that what we can do within the treatment system. If you're working with a person and they understand the framework, they understand the stages of change, they understand that it's a, it may be a recurrence, that's not a negative thing, that that may be a part of their stages of change, of their recovery, rather than relapse and the stigma that is connected to relapse. Relapse is this, this horrible place that once you fall down, that sometimes you don't get up from. So that's a way that we can work with the treatment system. You know, and I also think that, that this we're presenting really a moving target, if you will. Mm -hmm. It's uh, probably what you would call the flavor of the month syndrome, and that also language is open to interpretation. Mm -hmm. Like prevention to somebody in the field would probably mean something that's an evidence-based practice, but if you talk to a community person, prevention would be keeping the recreation center open mm -hmm. for hours. Mm -hmm. We talk of things like paradigm shift or mm -hmm. transformation, and all of these terms we use, so we have co-occurring, we have substance use disorder, we have substance abuser, we have chronic illness, we have dis disorder, and I, I think it's confusing. It's confusing to the field itself, and, and, and sometimes we, we fall into this trap where we think language is interchangeable, and I think it causes more harm than good. You know, you've hit on something that I have observed over the last 13 years that I've been at SAMHSA. And, and that is that just when you get comfortable mm -hmm. using one terminology, mm -hmm. along comes someone else and then they find, particularly not only in the substance use disorder field, but also in the mental illness field, mm -hmm. right, John? I mean, it's, it's just, you know, uh, as difficult as we find the, the subject matter in, in the substance use disorder field, you know, mm -hmm. the mental illness side also yeah. presents with, I think, some similar uh, circumstances. For sure. When you think about other disorders, for example, the thought the, one, the disorder comes to mind quickly when, as a first cousin of substance use disorder, are eating disorders. Now, when you talk about eating disorders, we always invariably people use the term inside, outside of the field. They refer to it as an eating disorder, not as food abuse, mm -hmm. or f and don't refer to them as food abusers. Mm -hmm. Um, and that has grown up just in a, in a very uh, consistent fashion. It's always been eating disorders, as far as I can remember. It's never been anything else. Uh, and I've never heard the term food abuser. Uh, even, and so uh, it has, there are models for this mm -hmm. kind of terminology which seem to be palatable, uh, acceptable to most people uh, when you're talking about food. Uh, but when it comes to substances, uh, of course, we have this uh, abuser term. Somehow it's gotten into the, uh, our language and culture and uh, becomes very difficult to shift. And if I could just mention uh, how this may be actually unconscious and the effects of it may be unconscious is that uh, we did a study where we randomly assigned the term abuser, substance abuser, and substance use disorders. We had those two terms. And these were mental health practitioners. Many of them were doctoral level. Uh, 500 and over 500 clinicians uh, doing this study. Um, and they had a vignette which described someone with a substance-related problem. Uh, and the, the vignettes were identical except for the term used. So half the subjects got uh, the vignette describing the individual as a substance abuser, and half, them, half of them got the individual described as a, having a substance use disorder. And then they were asked, 
uh, a number of questions about whether they uh, perceive this person needed treatment versus should be uh, punished, um, whether they had sympathy for the person, uh, whether they were able to control their problem, so this kind of issue of self-regulation, um, whether they thought they were personally to blame for the, situa for the problem that they had. Um, and those who were assigned the substance abuser condition were more likely to have more punitive attitudes uh, than those who had the substance use disorder condition. And these were, these were doctoral level, mostly doctoral level mental health clinicians. Mm -hmm. So it may be that even unconsciously it triggers a bias that people aren't even aware of. I think this is very important um, because even though we may use the term ourselves thinking, well, I don't mean it like that, I mean it like this, I mean it in a more general sense, and I certainly don't mean it in a stigmatizing way, but what can be conveyed and picked up unconsciously perhaps is that it does evoke, elicit these more punitive uh, attitudes towards these individuals. And when we come back, we're going to continue to chat about that. I'm, I think we need to get into a dialogue about how we can change this. We'll mm -hmm. be right back. It's important to be familiar with the proper terminology surrounding addiction and recovery. One of the terms you'll want to be familiar with is discrimination. Discrimination is treating someone less favorably than someone else because he or she has, once had, or is regarded as having a disability. For more information on this and other recovery jargon, visit the Recovery Month website. People who suffer from drug or alcohol addiction sometimes say hurtful things. They drive the people who love them most away. If you know someone who suffers from drug or alcohol addiction, listen. Try to hear what they are really saying. Know that there is hope and help them find their voice again. For drug or alcohol treatment referral for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. They tell me I was there, but I don't remember. I don't know where I really was. I do not know what I had for breakfast. I do not know who won the game. I don't recognize this man. If you or someone you know is struggling with a drug or alcohol problem, there is a solution. Recovery. Call 1-800-662-HELP for information and for hope. Through treatment, my life's a whole lot brighter now. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Language is such an important part of communicating with people what um, addiction, mental health disorders, and recovery is all about. Um, a lot of people have stereotypes about what these, um, what these disorders are all about, and they're not accurate. And so using language can really help people understand what those uh, disorders are about, what they mean, uh, and how people are uh, living uh, successfully. Uh, in recovery today. Um, Our Stories Have Power was a training that was developed by Faces and Voices of Recovery uh, in conjunction uh, with funding from SAMHSA. People in the recovery community have been looking for a long time for language that they can use to really describe what it is that they've been through and what it is uh, that they're trying to advocate for. So Faces and Voices of Recovery has used uh, the training as an opportunity to create a, a video, a DVD, uh, that can be um, you know, sent around the country, uh, can be uh, put on the internet, um, can be, really be used in trainings and in workshops around the country uh, so that more people have the terminology that's necessary uh, to communicate our, our message to the broadest possible audience. 
Uh, there are uh, three major sections of the DVD. Uh, the first is a 90-minute uh, training video, which takes you through Faces and Voices of Recovery's media and message training, the actual core training itself. The second part of the DVD is a section called Keys to Successful Interviews. That section really is helpful for people who are going to be going into an interview situation and they need to brush up on some basic skills. And then the third section of the DVD contains all the materials, the PowerPoint materials, our message training, our tips on successful media interviews uh, that folks can use uh, to further their skills as they go along through this training. You have recently gotten involved with Faces and Voices of Recovery, Laura. Tell me why you got involved with Faces and Voices of Recovery and why you, what brought you to this work? I am so thrilled to be part of this organization. I'm really proud to be part of it. Um, they have a message that is very near and dear to my heart, which is uh, sharing the message of hope and recovery uh, to having a new way of life. I took away from the messaging training that I attended last fall that there are the right words to use and, and not so good words to use. For example, we want to talk about recovery. We don't want to talk about addiction. Addiction is where people are stuck in the problem. Recovery is where people get into the solution, and that's what it's all about, giving people hope and healing and a new way of life. Some of the main questions that we receive is, what kind of training is this? You know, and when you say media message training, uh, that means that if the media uh, put a microphone and camera to my face and say, uh, Joe, I heard that you uh, used drugs and alcohol before, uh, and who are you? And how do I respond to the media and how do I respond to where the community and the public can know that the benefits of long-term recovery? I think the main message there is that people in long-term recovery can move on to advocate for people with addictions and people to also get long-term recovery like they did. Uh, the message is real clear that the benefits of recovery, it works. Um, and that's a reality for many people that's in recovery today. Laureen, you wanted to Yeah, I really want to comment. comment on something that, that Carlos said and connected to what John was saying. Carlos talked about the confusion around the language, and John talked about the research that really showed how using um, strength-based language, how it impacts the person. And I think that there is this flavor of the day language. I mean, we, you know, chemical dependency, we, it's always something different. But I think there's an opportunity here for us to really show the leadership because I think the difference is, is that this language that we want to promote is actually something that's going to help people. It is the right thing to do. So I think rather than it being this floating flavor of the day that we actually have to take the leadership and make sure that people are using language that is going to promote this culture of recovery. But particularly now, I think with the health care reform, Daphne, do we have an opportunity here we have in order to, to really turn things around? We have a huge opportunity here. The country is talking about health care reform. The country is talking about health, and this is time to take this, this issue out of the crime pages and into the health pages. Mm -hmm. This is a health issue, mm -hmm. and when we begin to understand that fundamentally in our own hearts, from, the, from, from academia to clinicians to the folks working in our prisons and jails, to understand that we are talking about individual health. This is a, a gigantic opportunity, and uh, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity because this changes the way people see themselves. When you come, a lot of people who have suffered with addiction suffer from just horrible feelings of, of inadequacy, shame, shame isolation, yes. and so forth. And when you learn that this is actually something that you have an ability to begin to treat that other people have overcome themselves, that this is about health. And when you can move from saying, I feel sick, to I feel well, as opposed to I, from going from I feel, you know, I'm a bad person to a good person. We're talking about moving from sickness to health. So yeah, it's a great opportunity. Yeah, and I'd like to mirror Daphne's comments. I'm really, really excited about national health care reform, but I also feel that it's wrought with pitfalls because I believe we're going to interject a whole new set of language into the conversation, if you will. Um, did a lot of organizing around um, uh, the Parity Act and making sure that substance abuse was included 
suited in the languish in the Substance Wellstone. Substance abuse? Right? Yes, because it was the Wellstone mental health Substance paradigm. Substance abuse? Am so, I hearing Substance yes, abuse? Ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And, and you know, Daphne has, has quoted Bill White quite a bit, and, and he is truly a prolific writer, and agree with uh, the title that folks have given him, the Dean of Recovery. But he was saying there are three ways to deal with social uh, uh, stigma, stigmatization, stigma, stigma, if you will. Um, one is to protest. Stigma and discrimination are illegal, and you need to protest, protest that and bring it to the forefront and hold uh, the, the folks that are doing it accountable. But there also is an educational component he talks about, and then there's a contact component. And this, um, this is not new. I got this from a 2009 paper that he did with Arthur Evans. And so I think you had suggested it. We need a multi-pronged approach where stigma is alive and well and where uh, folks are comfortable with that, we need to hold them accountable. But we need to do some education as well within the field uh, as well as outside the field. And then I think we need to look at establishing new contacts and reaching out to non-traditional groups, if you will. Uh, the recovering community, I believe that we could do more in reaching out to them. And I think that is, that is, I tell you, I have been through National Alcohol and Drug Addiction Recovery Month and its events and the testimonials that we see from individuals in recovery. And it's almost painful to see what Daphne was saying in terms of a shame-based uh, approach to, to their recovery. And it, it really, I think it's, it's an area where uh, folks in recovery are going to have to work with other folks in recovery to, to bring them along to a comfort level where individuals can then be free of that self-perception in order for them to change their language. Do you agree, John? Mm -hmm. I do. I do, absolutely. Um, I think this issue of stigma, which is directly obviously connected to the terms that we use, is, is very important. Um, I was just thinking about the, uh, the World Health, and this is not a U.S. phenomenon either, it's, it's cross-national. The World Health Organization did a study in, in the late 90s across 14 different countries looking at 18 of the most stigmatized conditions, including drug and alcohol addiction. So they had things like being homeless, being a criminal, being HIV positive, all these very heavily stigmatized conditions. Um, and what they found cross-nationally, drug addiction was number one. Mm -hmm. Alcohol addiction was number four. So mm -hmm. two of the top four uh, were the most stigmatized conditions cross-nationally. And stigma, uh, and that surprised me. I mean, obviously, we all know that these conditions are very stigmatized. Just how stigmatized, I didn't realize mm -hmm. uh, that they would, they would come top of that list. Um, so that was very surprising to me. So what we're dealing with is possibly and probably the most stigmatized of all social mm -hmm. problems, if mm -hmm. you frame it in that, put it in that framework. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, importantly, there are two factors that I see moderate stigma. One is cause, and the other is controllability. Cause being it's their fault, controllability, they can't help it. So there's those two factors. And I think that science now has contributed to our understanding that people with a substance use disorder, they may have had the initial choice to pick up a, a, a alcohol or another substance, uh, but it's not their fault that they become addicted. And this is something that's been, been around for a long time, but it eludes most of us, I think, most of the time. Um, and the other thing is controllability. Science has now, as I mentioned earlier, uh, helped our understanding in, in terms of people's inability, the impaired control, which we know is an essential, perhaps the essential characteristic of addiction, is this inability to control, this impaired control over, over use, despite harmful consequences. Mm -hmm. And so this issue of uh, uh, cause and controllability uh, and the science that's, that's really informed that have really helped, I think, to destigmatize. And we need to get that message out, that these are health problems, to, that they are treatable. They are probably the most, um, have the best prognosis of any mental disorder mm -hmm. in, on the severe end of the spectrum. Most people eventually recover from a substance use disorder. And these are the kinds of messages, because I think out there there's a lot of... Um, kind of uh, negative uh, thinking and nihilism regarding the, the prognosis for individuals with addiction. They're, they're, they're hopeless, there's no chance, we can't help them, uh, and, uh, and they lie all the time, and, and these kinds of very uh, 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 biased statements which, uh, sorry, 
you can say That's something. That's fine. Yeah. Um, I just want to say that when we come back, I want to get into the, the, the notion of how do we sustain a, a uh, uh, conversation of holding folks to be responsible in a way that doesn't stigmatize or doesn't discriminate. Because if we, if we, if we need to look at things differently, then we need to substitute that which we think now with something more positive, and, and we need to learn how to do that. We'll be right back. For more information on National Alcohol and Drug Addiction Recovery Month, events in your town, and how you can get involved, visit the Recovery Month website at recoverymonth.gov. People trapped by drug or alcohol addiction often feel like there's no hope, no way out. But for every lock, there's a key. And if you have a problem, it's good to know there are real solutions to help you get free. For drug or alcohol treatment referral for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. People who suffer from drug or alcohol addiction sometimes say hurtful things. They drive the people who love them most away. If you know someone who suffers from drug or alcohol addiction, listen. Try to hear what they are really saying. Know that there is hope and help them find their voice again. For drug or alcohol treatment referral for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Hi, I'm Michelle Monroe with The Road to Recovery, and we're here today in Maryland getting some opinions on what people think about different languages used in the substance abuse and mental health arena. If I said that somebody had a drug and alcohol addiction, what would you think that that means? Uh, I think the person has a, um, a certainly a health issue problem that uh, needs, to be, needs to be attended to. I would think of people struggling in difficult circumstances um, with certain underlying issues that, that lead them to feel that they need to use those things as an outlet. I think of an illness, I think of a sickness that's hard to overcome, um, and I think that the person needs support, as much support as possible. I think about people who need help, and they need to find help as soon as possible. So what if I said alcohol and drug problem? What do you feel about that? Uh, it's a problem that needs to be fixed. That's what I start thinking, you know, and you need to fix it, you need to find a way to fix it. Um, if there needs to be out there more programs for these people, more resources where they can get to as soon as possible, you know, where they can speak their languages, because alcohol doesn't have any color or any face, any language, it comes in any, it can be anybody. And then problem sounds like you just, you can deal with it if you seek for help. Then addiction sounds more like you are in serious problem. I think it's the same thing. I mean, I think that if you have an addiction, you have a problem. You know, if you have a problem, you could possibly have an addiction. So the same thing goes, you know, they need help, they have an illness, and they need support. If I told you I was in recovery, what does recovery mean to you? I think you're really trying to get, get back on the right track, and, and I would certainly pray for you and hope that you could stay there and get better because Recovery is very difficult. Uh, you, first of all, you have to admit that you need the recovery, and then when you recover, uh, it takes, it's a long process. I think when a person says that they are in recovery and they are trying to get over their addiction, one must give them a chance and believe them. Recovery to me is a first step. Just because you're in recovery, that doesn't mean that you're going to be recovered completely. So, but it's the first step for you to get to where you need to get to be able to say, I used to be that. If, if you're telling me that you're in recovery, I'd say that you are trying to get your life together if you have a serious problem and that you're, you care about becoming a better person. If somebody was trying to get into recovery and needed treatment and needed help, do you have a role in their recovery? And if you have a role, what role would, do you think you would need to play? I've been taught that uh, the whole family as well as the community plays a role in your recovery. So, I think you really have to love them and help them through it and don't pro uh, prosecute them and make them think that they're doing something wrong. And, 
and give them support. If the person is open to letting you help them, um, just really being there to support them, um, you know, give them that emotional support that they need. I do have a role. I think people who's you know seeking for help, they do need uh, support from others because um, obviously they cannot cope by themselves with the issues they may have. So I guess my role will be like just be there um, and supportive and try to be a friend and understand what they are going through. Um, I'd probably just want to like speak into their life as much as possible and try to encourage them that I think realization for them is the most important to realize that they have an addiction problem and then to go about trying to help them through recovery and being as supportive as possible in the process. Do you think that recovery is possible and that people can make a change? It will be hard, it's very hard, but it's possible. Anything's possible. Yeah, I absolutely think recovery is possible and it's it's something different for each person, but it um, it's probably a long process and will take a lot for them to be able to recover. Recovery is definitely possible. Where there's a will, there's a way, so everybody who really wants to recover, I believe they can recover, but they just have to really try. Yeah, I think you can recover. I think it, like a lot of it depends on environment, like you gotta get away from what you're doing and you know, if you want to, if you want to do it, you can. So Daphne, how do we change the paradigm? How do we begin to use positive language, person-centered, people-first type of language? We begin by being conscious of the words that we're using. And there are a number of uh, words and papers and reports and so forth out there that promote words like health and recovery and person-centered and mutual support and so forth. And so there's a, there's a model that talks about going from unconscious incompetence at something where you, where you do something and it's not what you want to do but you're not even aware of it to conscious incompetence where you begin to be aware that these aren't the terms I want to use mm -hmm. to conscious competence and we're starting to be more aware of the terminology we're using to unconscious competence and I think that's what we want to do as a field is move to a point where we're automatically speaking in positive person-centered health-centered Pro approaches. You two folks are in recovery. Now, there are going to be folks out there that are going to say, all right, based on what John was saying, how do you then hold the person responsible for their need to keep themselves in the straight and narrow, even though they may have had a, a recurring need for treatment. How do we then begin to reshape that to still not be offensive, but to get our, a, a point across? Well, I, I really, connected to what you're saying, I really want to comment on what Daphne was saying. I think that we have to demand that people begin using the right language. And there's a very simple and easy and concrete way to do that. One of the things that I've noticed is that People are not adapting the new language, but they're still being supported in certain ways. Whenever someone has to write an, an RFP for something, they need to be using the correct language. I, I've seen RFPs that have been written, and I can see by the language that's being used that they are not, they're not moved to this whole framework of recovery, but they're still being awarded. So we need to help people to begin to use, and if we do that, they're going to pick it up immediately because people need, um, organizations need funding. Yes. Well, I Pardon believe me. SAMHSA has done a great job in, in laying the framework for, if you will, for the type of discussion that I think needs to happen. And I think it's around the recovery or any system of care model mm -hmm. that's person-centered and it's based more on a holistic approach that it's, it's um, person-driven, if you will. And I, and I think we just need to build upon that. I think that's the way we begin to have the kind of conversations where all of a sudden, instead of 200,000 uh, recovery advocates, you're making greater headroads into the 20 million 
people in recovery that Ms. Hyde talks about. So instead of reaching less than three million and providing services, we make inroads into the 22 and a half million that still need that. Our message isn't resonating with multiple groups. And so as a field, I think we want to look at our message. And I think to have that universal language is going to mean that we can't view non-traditional groups as still target populations, if you will, from a deficit perspective, but then we begin to view them as key informants, that they have valuable information that can add to this discussion. And until we begin to do that, it's our, our, our whole efforts are going to be based around uh, self-serving. We need this particular language to protect our funding stream. We need this particular language to add value to the work that we do versus our primary purpose is to provide the services and the help for people that are struggling with substance abuse or addiction and any of the other issues that they present to us with. Or we need a language whereby I can recognize where I need to do additional work and it's not going to be belittling me or diminishing my worth, but that I can pick up the pieces and move forward again in that path to recovery. Because I think one of the things that we learned early on with the recovery-oriented system of care uh, notion was that particularly uh, Thomas Kirk's model in Connecticut is that the person is considered to be in recovery the second mm -hmm. they have that aha moment, mm -hmm. that they realize that they need treatment mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. their mm -hmm. Uh, illness mm -hmm. and 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 from then on they still consider themselves in in recovery would that work I, I mean in other I sectors that, I, I think that that's very very important and one of the things that I want to say is that in terms of the development of the recovery oriented system of care the focus on language has not been something that I've seen and I think that everything we do if we're, if we're doing a conference, whatever we do, there needs to be a component in there on language. We really need to push this because it's, it's, it's something that we can do that doesn't cost a lot of money, but it's key. It's key in how we define and how we build our systems. Well, I believe very strongly that the work that, that, that CSAT has done uh, uh, and Kathy Nugent within one of our branches with the addiction technology transfer mm -hmm. centers is beginning to do that quite a bit. Uh, I think that it is a very conscious effort mm -hmm. at, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're struggling internally and, and working at it. And so, you know, the process is, it's almost like eating an elephant. You know, how do you begin to eat an elephant? It's got to be one bite, bite at, at a time. time. <laughs> so we, we are beginning to make inroads into that area, particularly with the materials from, from that are being developed within the ATTC. Certainly the planning partners for Recovery Month, right, Daphne? Yes, indeed. That's been such a valuable group to move the conversation forward throughout the year, not just in September during Recovery Month, but throughout the year to keep this issue elevated. Mm -hmm. So the question is, is what type of system is somebody coming into? I think it's a system that needs to be all-encompassing that can provide services wherever, mm -hmm. whichever doorway the person chooses. And I'm, I'm just really grateful to the, the initiatives that SAMHSA and, and the federal government have supported around the access to recovery program, yes. the recovery community support programs mm -hmm. that fostered this peer-to-peer uh, -peer interaction where they're non-traditional approaches. But that creating that peer-to-peer -peer interaction, I think is just so critical. Now, it's not a slight on the, the academics or the, the, the clinical or the treatment professional, but there's that empathy factor between one person yeah, that has experienced yeah, yeah. this helping another person. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to promote more of that. So um, I'm, I'm a big believer that money isn't the answer to everything, mm -hmm. but I believe that SAMHSA hit on something when they were funding those type and programs. And in doing so, those individuals that are helping each other, maybe they can help each other on the language front as well Absolutely. as how do they view themselves and how to. I want to go back to John. John, talk to me about some of the articles where people can access more information. If I want to learn more about this, uh, you mentioned that you had authored some uh, articles that may be helpful. Well, yeah, uh, the, um, you know, the question is, is w which terms, if we're not going to use certain terms, what terms should we recommend and ad advocate for? Uh, and I know Daphne has written a lot uh, about this and, and, and also Bill White. Uh, I published a paper in 2004 in the um, treatment, alcoholism treatment quarterly. 
which uh, actually talks a lot about the issue of um, terminology and how it may affect, how it's imprecise. Um, for example, we use the term abuse generically, but also it's a diagnostic label. Mm -hmm. It's actually a, a DSM diagnostic label, mm -hmm. which creates a lot of confusion when you see it written. Are they referring to the more generic uh, issue, you know, regarding the whole range of problems versus a particular diagnosis, okay, that has a specific meaning. So it's imprecisely used, and this is a problem, of course, in communication. Um, so one of the things that um, I think we need, to, we need to have a term that describes these problems generically. And the and Institute more of Medicine term. has tried to deal with that, have mm -hmm. they not? Yes, um, uh, and the World Health Organization too. So um, in the 1970s, they were advocating against using the term abuse, even though uh, the American Psychiatric Association adopted that term, uh, which is unfortunate because then that gives rise to the term abuser, uh, naturally. Uh, and, and that was the warning, actually, back in the 70s. It was saying, this is what's going to happen, is that you're going um, to generate this term by using so, that term. So what do we replace that so, with? So there are, there are a couple of things that I see and I wrote, wrote about in that paper and papers since then, uh, is to use... Um, for example, if someone has a diagnosable substance use disorder, to use that term, substance use disorder. Mm -hmm. um, if we're talking about it generically, we might refer to individuals with a substance-related problem or mm -hmm. substance-related condition. Another term in other countries that have been used is uh, substance misuse, so the misuse of a particular drug or alcohol. Mm -hmm. uh, and so these are three terms, substance-related problem or substance-related condition. Again, person first. It's an individual with a substance-related problem or substance-related condition. Substance misuse as opposed to abuse, then that doesn't give rise to that negative connotation regarding abuser. Uh, and then substance use disorder. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned before, uh, eating, e eating disorders, no problem. Everybody refers to them as eating disorders, not as food abusers. Uh, and I think we should do the same with substance use disorders. Well, I've certainly uh, enjoyed uh, dealing with this subject matter today. And I want to remind folks that National Alcohol and Drug Addiction Recovery Month does work to reduce the discrimination associated with individuals in recovery and those that need to go into treatment is celebrated every September. We certainly hope that you have learned that during this month, we not only have to use the right language, but we have to embrace the whole concept of support for those in recovery and those who need treatment and their families within their community. So I want to thank you for being here. It's been a terrific show. Thank you. For a copy of this program or other programs in the Road to Recovery series, call SAMHSA at 1-800-662-HELP or order online at recoverymonth.gov and click multimedia. Every September, National Alcohol and Drug Addiction Recovery Month provides an opportunity for communities like yours to raise awareness of alcohol and drug use disorders and highlight the effectiveness of treatment. In order to help you plan events and activities in commemoration of this year's Recovery Month observance, the Free Recovery Month Kit offers ideas, materials, and tools for planning organizing and realizing an event or outreach campaign that matches your goals and resources. To obtain your copy of this year's Recovery Month kit and gain access to other free publications and materials related to addiction treatment and recovery issues, visit the Recovery Month website at www.recoverymonth.gov or call 1-800-662-HELP. It's important that everyone become involved because addiction is our nation's number one health problem and treatment is our best tool to address it.